Hey everyone, and welcome to a new series. This lecture series is going to be for my social psychology class, and I specifically am creating it to align with my online social psychology class that I'm teaching in July 2020. Sort of a um, a a sort of smooth over from the fall pandemic kind of stuff and setting me up for an online course in July just to be on the safe side. So in this lecture, we're going to get started with the material in this class. So a couple of things that we are going to do in the situation for this particular class in this particular lecture is sort of talk about broadly what social psychology is, and then talk a little bit about research methods. Uh, and I'll get to that point in a little in a little bit. So what I first want to talk about is what the hell is social psychology? Why are we talking about it? What's it for? What's its use? What's it good for, right? And so a few things that we are going to go over in this particular lecture involve things like the power of the situation, Core assumptions, questions about behavior, okay? And I want to specifically mention that social psychology is about people, the individual, in a group, okay? Which is why we're going to focus a lot throughout this course on situations, okay? And then the second part of this lecture is going to uh, briefly mention things that I think are going to be important to know about research methods. So what are research questions? How do we do measurement? What kind of designs am I going to talk about frequently in this class? And what about the human experience changes the way that we act? I think these four things are useful to understand later stuff, right? OK, so what is Social psychology. Well, our good friend Gordon Alport in 1968 gave a pretty good definition. OK, so his definition, Gordon Alport's 1968, was an attempt to understand and explain two very important features of just psychological science in general, how thoughts, feelings, and behaviors of individuals are influenced by the actual imagined or implied presence of other human beings, okay? So let's go back to that first part, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. How people think about, how they influence, or how they relate to one another. What does the social environment have to do with it? What do we mean by actual, imagined, or implied? Think to yourself, okay, so actual social situations. What's actually going to happen? What are my thoughts, feelings, and behaviors in actual social situations? Here I'm talking to my mom, or I'm talking to my friend, or I'm talking to my wife, uh, or I'm talking to a group of students. I can have actual interactions with them. Imagined. Remember the times that you're like, hmm, what should I say to that person? What should I do to that person? Implied. We're going to talk about implied, how we think about the various implications of other people's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors in a group or a social interaction setting. But wait, you say... Why on earth do we need a bunch of scientists to do this when we do it ourselves all the time? We're humans. We don't know things about humans. That's weird, Dr. Swan. Why would you say that? Of course, social psychology is common sense, right? Hmm. You've probably heard this one before. When it comes to liking other people, opposites attract. Not so much. Not so much. Similarity and liking. 
Not necessarily always the case, but a lot of the times it is. Way, way, way more evidence for similarity rather than dissimilarity. So, mm, that one, mm mm-mm. If you were alone in a big city and hurt yourself, you would be more likely to get help if there were 10 people nearby instead of just one or two. Not quite, not quite on that one, although you might, might think that one is true. However, research suggests, and we'll talk about this at the end of the term, more bystanders, generally speaking, means less help. Hmm, so that one. Mm-mm-mm. All right, doing someone a favor will increase the possibility that they will like you. Now, this is true sometimes, but, and this is a big but, People don't like feeling indebted or if strings are attached. That doesn't breed reciprocity like you think it will. They also don't like favors. People don't like favors that are more generous, that they perceive the level of communality the relationship to be. So, for example, if you have an acquaintance and they give you a huge gift that's worth hundreds of dollars, you're like, whoa, whoa. Whoa, I don't know you that well, bro. I can't give you something of equal value. That's just not going to happen. One, I don't have the money. And two, that's we're acquaintances. We're not friends, but this $100 gift, maybe we should be friends. I don't know. So this one, maybe not. Next one. If someone rewards you for performing an interesting activity, you will probably like it even more. No, this one's this one's not true. We'll talk about this one next week in more detail. But rewards specifically as a- extrinsic information decrease intrinsic motivation. So if you're getting paid for something, that's why you do it. Not because it makes you feel good. Hmm. So that one. Last one. Last one. If you're feeling angry, the best thing to do is to vent or blow off some steam. So this one's a little dicey. This one's a little dicey. Catharsis which you've probably heard of and like I did I I threw some some an axe at a at a at a board and that felt really good. I like to break things and that's very cathartic. Well, catharsis, the hypothesis associated with catharsis is actually not true. There's very little evidence to support its soothing and calming features. It actually seems to predict this venting or venting your frustration actually seems to predict increased, increased aggression. That's not good. That's not good at all. So this one. Nope. So common sense ain't too common. And it doesn't make much sense. Here's a dollar. Here's a dollar. We don't usually think about things in the most common of sensical ways. Most of the things that we're going to talk about in this class are counterintuitive to your lay social psychology. That is, the social psychology that you have when you interact with people and you're like, oh, yeah, I know that. I know, how to, I know how to interact with everyone. I know all these cool cats and kittens. We know how to interact. It's just not it's just not it's mostly counterintuitive. Now, I do have a content warning for the next slide. It's it's a little rough. It's a little rough. This slide is from 2004, three or four. Yeah, 2003. Um, So this is a prisoner of war 
uh, in Iraq at a prison called Abu Ghraib shortly after the United States invaded Iraq to remove Saddam Hussein from power under the false pretense um, that he had weapons of mass destruction. Of course, uh, if you know anything about recent history, that weapons of mass destruction, destruction claim was found to be not true. So who did that? Who did that to that prisoner, make, making him stand like that on a, an, on a thin wooden board or a box of some kind, draped in a black robe? He's naked underneath and um, wearing a black hood. You might think to yourself, if I were in charge of that prison, I'd never do that. Well, here's the problem. The people that made this person do that and much, much more heinous stuff were American service members, men and women in the military who were running the prison, making these prisoners do these things. And we looked and, and we uh, we think to ourselves, oh, wow, I would never do that. that that'd be crazy. But here's where the situation sort of just got those juices flowing. Uh, they got caught up in the moment, not saying what they did was right, but they got caught up in the moment and they were like, yeah, these Iraqis are bad and we got to treat them badly. Of course, we can't do that to prisoners of war. So what did the Department of Defense do? They removed 17 soldiers and officers from duty, and seven of those 17 were charged for dereliction of duty, which is not very good, maltreatment, aggravated assault, and battery. In May 2000, between May 2004 and, May, and September 2005, they were con convicted uh, and court-martialed, okay, sentenced to federal prison, and dishonorably discharged two of them were sentenced to 10 years and three years, respectively, in federal prison. Okay. The commission, the panel that was meant to in investigate this, uh, sent to the DOD a final report, and they said, quote, the panel finds no evidence that organizations above the 800th Military Police Brigade or the 205th Michigan Brigade, Brigade level were directly involved in incidents at Abu Ghraib. So it was contained within those two units, but they still did this crazy, crazy heinous stuff. OK, so the questions we want to ask throughout this course are why did the situation, why did the environment do that to seemingly useful, helpful, accountable servicemen and women. What about prisons made that a situation? Could this happen to normal people? Maybe it could. Maybe it could. Any given social situation affects different people differently. Different people differently. So you're never going to have the same thing, okay? Any distinction that we make between situation and people, kinds of people, types of people in this class, are not going to be set in stone. Very malleable. They, you can change them, mold them. You can super stretch Armstrong them. Most findings will be accurate if we say things like, in situation X with features A, B, and C, why type of people typically behave like Z? Oh my gosh, but that is so terribly inefficient. Oh, we, it, it's really difficult to just do that only. We can't really do that. So just keep that in mind as we go through this. Most findings that I say will remove most of that information. I'll just say cause X, effect Y. 
And we'll talk about that when we get to research methods a little later on in this video. Another caveat is that people, not, people often choose their situations, okay? So is that gonna affect you? Well, yeah, maybe if you, you, you had some idea about going into that situation, okay? You chose to take this class, you chose to be in this situation. Peepin, people often create their situations. Yeah, you may have done that to yourself, basically. Yeah, you did that to yourself. And then one thing that I will mention throughout this course is I'll bring in biology and culture. Culture is a good aspect to keep in mind. But what's sometimes missed in these discussions is biology. And so we're going to take a biopsychosocial approach to people and situations, okay, to let us know, to inform us, to have the underpinnings of what somebody might do in a new or novel situation. And we're going to, then we're going to be able to interpret that situation according to that person's biology and that person's culture. Okay. That's really important. And that changes the way we act, which is going to change the way the situation is affected and affects us. So this is a multi-level, super complex situation because people are complex. I want you to keep that in mind as well throughout this course. I'm going to give you some simplified findings when we talk about A, B, and C. But keep that in mind that this is an incredibly complex situation, an incredibly complex environment that I've crunched down into a factoid soundbite, a, a thing that you can chew on, right? That you don't have to chew on for hours. You can chew on for like five minutes. But there are going to be some things that I do want you to think about, that I want you to consider as we go through some of the more difficult things. Like in week three, when we talk about racism and prejudice and stereotypes and discrimination, those are some hard topics. I want you to chew on those a little bit longer because our actions in those situations change situations. Okay. A good friend, Kurt Lewin here, or Leuven, if you uh, are uh, from Germany, he is considered by many to be the father of social psychology. That's him right there. He's a good-looking dude, isn't he? He's a good-looking dude. He came from Germany. He got out of there before, uh, got out of there before World War II, and so he did a lot of his important work here in the United States. And one of his extremely important contributions to psychology, as well as what is now known as social psychology, which is why he's considered um, il papa on that one, is B equals the function of P and E. Okay, so what, <laughs> what does that mean? Well, it's actually pretty simple. Behavior equals the function of the person and their environment. Okay. The interaction of, of the person and the environment. Person is things like culture, biology, genes, okay, personality, type, thinking style. A thinking ability, so on and so forth. So behavior is the function of the interaction of the person and their environment. Okay, and so this debate of nature versus nurture is out of the out of the woods at the gate. 1936, out the gate, it is an interaction of nature and nurture. Okay, it's a good idea to keep this 
equation in mind so we don't dip into one camp or the other. The biopsychosocial model, which is the modern equivalent of this, is that these three things, biology, psychology, and so social cultural factors are all integrated and interact. They're, they're connected. It's a web. It's a mesh. It's, it's like a Venn diagram of complexity. Okay. That's what we're going to be talking about here. It's very important that we don't tip in one side or the other. Okay. Uh, early theoretical influences in social psychology also include uh, Darwin and Freud talking about biological influences. So these would go under the P. Behaviorism, so reinforcement, uh, punishment, uh, classical conditioning, Watson, Watson uh, B.F. Skinner, those are your environment. Okay. And then competing influences between the environment and the person, which then becomes behavior. Okay. Lastly, we're going to focus a lot on dispositional attributions and situational attributions. I'll do that later in the week in another video where we talk about attributions specifically. Kurt Lewin here spent a lot of time discussing these two things. So dispositional attributions are things that we think come from the within the person and situational attributions are things we think come from the environment. So it's really important to note that there are differences here and these differences change the way we think about people and the behaviors that they do. Okay, Because we can't be in anybody's head, right? I can't read someone's mind like Professor Xavier, right? I have to make assumptions about what they're doing and why they're doing it. And so this B equals the function of P and E is very important to determining dispositional E and so situational E causes of behavior. So I wanted to talk about the four core assumptions of social psychology. Okay. The four core assumptions. I'll do these fairly quickly and then you can pause and sort of spend a little bit more time with them if you'd like. And I want this video going too long. So Kurt Lewin said this is a pretty big assumption for social psych. This is assumption number one. Behavior is the joint product of the person in the situation, as we just said. So I'm going to skip over that one. You can read the text if you'd like. Slides are also available on the course LMS. Sorry to anybody not in the course that cannot get those PowerPoints. This is all you got. You can pause. Bestinger, a guy we'll talk about in a little while, in a couple of weeks, uh, says behavior depends on the socially constructed view of reality. So you might think that reality is something that you are in and it is objective and there is some sort of truth that you can find in it. OK, that you can find that there is this reality and this reality alone. And that's the reality that I'm in and everyone else is in. Unfortunately, that's not how reality works. <laughs> of course, we're trying to find some sort of objective reality, but it may be unattainable. With the way humans work, it's probably 100% unattainable. Okay? And the interesting thing about it is that anything that comes from a human, it, their thoughts, their feelings, their behaviors and actions, are from a socially constructed point of view. You come to college and sit in a classroom because you learned when you were three, four, five years old that that's how school works. Okay? But somebody decided that's how school's going to work. This is what I'm going to do. Somebody's going to stand up and talk about things. And people are going to sit and listen. Sit and listen. A teacher, what are you talking about? Why, you, you know, that's socially constructed. And one of the ways that we come to understand ourselves is through social comparison. We create um, 
the the self from not only what we think and feel and do, but what others think and feel and do in front of us and how we compare to them. This is a critical assumption. Okay, Sorry to break any objective reality um, bubbles there. Third assumption, behavior is strongly influenced by our social cognition. Again, this is coming later this week. The way individuals understand people, other people, despite accuracy or inaccuracy of the understanding, has a powerful influence on that individual's social behavior. So how we think about other people and how we think about ourselves in social situations is going to then be a cause to further behavioral or thought effects, okay? Psychological, social effects, okay? And, it, and, and this is regardless of how accurate or inaccurate we are. Inaccurate or accuracy is, is, is often this, this lane over here. It's not important in our social cognition. Of course, we try to be accurate, as accurate as possible, but lots of times we are not in our social um in our uh in our uh, social cognitions a lot of times we're not and that was uh an assumption made by Heider, by the way the fourth assumption the best way to understand social behavior is to use the scientific method hey kurt were you listening to what i was talking about on the outline thread Oh, you sly dog. Oh, you sly dog. Okay, we are going to talk about the scientific method in a super condensed form in a few minutes. But yeah, that's the fourth assumption that you're not going to understand human behavior unless you do the scientific work. Okay, by accumulating knowledge, ruling out confounds, determining causes and effects, creating a theory to explain everything. The one theory to rule them all. The last thing that we mentioned for the top at the top of the outline is that um, we can't know anything about psychology un- and social psychology and uh, specifically unless we ask questions about people's behaviors, what we can observe. It's very important that we ask questions about behavior and then step back to see whether or not we can uh, find cognitive aspects like the thoughts inside the black box. It's very important that we do that because psycho- one of psychology broadly, one of psychology's goals is to explain human behavior. And now we're talking about the human, the individual in social situations, and so now we're talking about social psychology's goal of explaining human behavior, and we gotta ask questions. We gotta say, hey, why do people do that? How do people do that? When do people do that? Okay. So we have to ask ourselves and others the causes of human behavior to give us insight. But there are some issues. There are some issues. One, a lot of self-report is going to be discussed in this class. A lot of self-report measures are going to be discussed in this class where a person comes and gets asked questions and they write down on a survey. Okay. Lots of times people don't answer honestly on those. Shocking, right? Shocking. The other issue is we don't really have a good grasp on causes of behaviors. And I want to characterize this by we don't have a good grasp on our behaviors before they occur. So that would be a priori causal behavior, uh, causal theories. We don't have a good idea of why we do things before we do them. We tend to do post hoc thinking about our behaviors, which are rationalizations and justifications. Those aren't the same as knowing beforehand why you're going to do what you're going to do. Okay. The other part of this is explaining other people's behaviors. Of course, as a scientist, as a new scientist, you and me, we're going to talk about this together through this course. We're going to talk about this together. And so we're going to explain other people's behaviors, right? Not you, but other people. Okay. 
we want to make sure, and this is leading into our discussion of of uh, this is going to lead into our discussion of research methods here in a moment. Intuition and experience lead us down dark paths. We need more than that. We need to add on top of reasoning, on, on top of intuition and experience. We need to add on top of that some deductive logic. And then we need to add on top of that systematic observation so we don't come up with faulty conclusions. Okay? Because if you just do intuition and maybe some inductive reasoning, you're going to have a unique window. You're going to be able to peer through that window just a little bit, you know, just a little bit. And it's going to be very limited. It's going to be whoop. confirmation bias. We're going to be talking about this a lot this semester semester this term we're gonna be talking about confirmation bias a lot it's sprinkled in pretty much everything we do and it's going to come up frequently okay so put a star next to confirmation bias on that one mark confirmation bias down time stamp this code okay because i'm coming i'm, I'm going to expand on it in just a minute okay So let's go through confirmation bias. So if you haven't heard of confirmation bias before, it's what happens when you are presented with or seeking out arguments. Okay? And what people tend to do is they accept arguments that they that confirm their worldviews or confirm their prior beliefs, hence the name confirmation bias. The other part of this is that a rejection of arguments and views that are against their current worldview or their prior beliefs, there'll be a rejection, okay? So confirm the good stuff and reject the bad stuff, or even ignore the bad stuff. Confirm the good stuff, ignore the bad stuff, okay? So here's an example from um, one of an, of one of the early, uh, earlier media-centered confirmation bias studies, uh, Lord and Colleagues, 1979. So what they did was they presented uh, subjects, participants in a research study, evidence for and against capital punishment. Capital punishment is the death penalty. So what happened was when people were presented with these things, they were more convinced on an attitude scale by the evidence that supported their initial attitude. So before they even read any of these arguments associated with capital punishment, they were asked, what do you think about capital punishment? Do you agree with it or do you disagree with it? Okay. And so what you see in these, these bars here is the... Does capital punishment deter crime? Yes or no? Does it not deter crime? Yes or no? Blue bars were supporters of capital punishment, and green bars were opponents of capital punishment. Okay? And so, how convincing was the study on capital punishment deterring crime? It was a fake study. It wasn't real. It was just generated for this argument. Okay? And so they generated two. They said, the study said... It does deter, deter crime. This study says it doesn't deter crime. Okay, And so you can see here that supporters of capital punishment increased their support. And they said, yeah, nah, this, this study's good stuff right here. This evidence is rock solid. The non-supporters of capital punishment were like, this study is garbage. This study is actual garbage. Actual garbage. On the other hand, it's opposite here. Not a lot of attitude change. Not a lot of attitude change for the opponents of capital punishment. They read that and they're like, yeah, that's the attitude that I have. It, 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 it kind of shows you that once you're against something from occurring, like, you know, the death penalty, there's not really much that you can be like, yeah, I'm now super against the death penalty. And so this this small little bar makes sense. So that's a count. And that is a an intuitive finding. 
as opposed to all of the counterintuitive findings that I'll talk about later. Uh, but you can see here that the blue bars, the supporters of capital punishment, were like, ah, this argument's garbage. The study's conclusion is garbage. It's garbage, everyone. Okay. So that's confirmation bias. Be on the lookout for that. Test yourself on that. Consider that every time we talk about some sort of practical finding in this class, do you have confirmation bias seeping in. Do you say to yourself, Dr. Swan doesn't know what he's talking about. This guy. Okay, are you a blue bar or are you a green bar? Guess what? They're the same. Blue bars and green bars. Everybody does confirmation bias. I'm not, I'm not here to admonish, admonish you about your confirmation bias. I do it too. The, it's it's a bias. It's 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 ingrained in your cognitive architecture. It's not going anywhere. It helps you. It helps you stay alive. But I will tell you that the best strategy to be a better human, to be a better human, is to understand your own biases and work through ways to reduce their impact. And so when we talk about things like confirmation bias, consider all sources of information, consider all sources of information, and then make an attitude decision. Are you positive? Are you negative? Are you neutral? Consider. Don't just jump to the gun. Consider. That's how you lessen the impact of cognitive biases on your decision making, your attitudes, and your your life. You know, friends, family members, they all do it. But you can be better, a better human, I promise. Sorry, I have to um, burst a few bubbles here. Um, yeah, there's gonna be some discussion of methodology throughout this course, and there's going to be a smidge of statistics. There's not going to be, you're not going to have to compute any statistics or anything, but I will be talking about percentages. I will be talking about correlations. I will be talking about causal effects. Okay, and so why should you care? Well, social psych is a science. It's one of the many ways to know things, but I think it's the best. <laughs> Of course, I think it's the best. I'm biased that way. And I'm going to be completely 100% open about that bias. I am 100% biased that science is the best way to know things. But it is just one way to know thing, things. Um, it's, and it's just one. And you have to use it right in order for it to be the best. If you use it wrong, just because you're like, it's science, doesn't mean that you are going to get the best information. You're going to get the answers that you're looking for. You got to use it right and you got to use it well. OK, so it's important to talk about methods and stats as we go through again. Not a lot of numbers. Or and definitely no calculations, but it's important to understand. OK, why is it important? Well, you need to understand and interpret conclusions. And you also need to know how far to interpret them, how deep the conclusion, how solid that conclusion is. All conclusions are uh, in sand. Okay? They're not set in stone. They are tenuous. But how tenuous is really what stats and methods is going to help you out with. When I say this is a fact, or when I say this is the effect of this cause, what does that mean? That's important. And if you ever take, or excuse me, if you never take another psych class and you don't go to grad school in psychology or anything like that and never do research, you are bombarded by social science research every day. And one of my goals for this course is for you to be able to use this stuff to interpret and consume that social science research that you consume. 
daily. It's a, it's a small goal, but it's worthy nevertheless. All right, so one of the first things we need to do is develop a question. What are we going to talk about? What, what do we want to know? What answers about the universe are we going to find? Okay. My, uh, so sources of questions and types of questions are what we're going to talk about first. Okay. So observation, uh, uh, a little thing from my personal experience. So when I was doing my master's degree in psychology about 10 years ago, the, re the thing that, that like propelled me down the topic was that I was consuming way too much cable news. Fox, MSNBC, CNN, I was just watching so much of it and it was rotting my brain and I didn't I didn't like that. And it was because uh, and, and it stemmed from the 2008 presidential election, uh, because then that's when I had access to all cable news at work, at home, just on the Internet, everywhere. Right. And that's where the information came from, just observing all of this. So I had to figure out from watching all these cable news channels and news uh, and news shows, what does the literature say on the topic that I wanted? And then I had to go and generate some hypotheses about it. OK, so that's my personal experience. You can also get generate questions through folk knowledge. OK, common sayings about relationships, for example. And what assumptions do they generate? So the example that we started off with earlier in the video, opposites attract. Well, what's the counter to that? Birds of a feather flock together. OK, so this is this is what's considered folk knowledge. So all those platitudes, cliches, all those things that, you know, that's our folk knowledge. That's what we just constantly repeat here and there. But what are the bases for that? Okay. What are the um, underpinnings for that? Are they real or all there, are they fake? Okay. Social problems and political issues, of course, are huge sources of questions Okay, because we deal with them every day. So social problems, things like divorce. What happens to children when parents get divorced? Okay. Political issues, things like legalizing cannabis. We can still ask, what does it do to the kids? <laughs> okay, so these political issues and these social problems are a deep, 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 deep well for questions. And then, of course, previous research is going to be a source of questions. Okay, so what did other people do previously? Those people in their previous research generated theories. Those theories are a set of assumptions to explain some sort of phenomenon or phenomena, connected, connected phenomena. Okay, And so you can then ask questions about an existing theory. Do these assumptions actually work together? Because okay? that's all a theory is. Collection of assumptions that has been tested over and over and over again, and it's an explanation. It's not just a hypothesis. You can't just say something, oh, it's just a theory, whatever. Incorrect. A lot of work went into developing that theory, and you should trust it quite a bit. I'm not saying blindly trust it. I'm saying you should trust it quite a bit and don't just knock it off, because that is what, that is what some folks do when they want to discount evolution. They say, oh, it's just a theory. It's a huge theory with a lot of evidence and a lot of information to back up the assumptions that were laid out by Darwin and others about natural selection. It's not just a theory. Okay, so let's get that one out of your mind. Not that I'm saying that theories are ironclad. They are not. They are open for debate. They are open for testing. That's how science works. So keep doing that, right? What kinds of questions do we have? Well, we have descriptive questions. We're going to talk a lot about descriptive questions. These are frequency stuff. These are how many people are doing things, what people are doing things in a given situation. Descriptive questions tend to be 
um, theory generating, right? As uh, if you get a lot, a lot, a lot of descriptive stuff in, then you can um, start then coming up with assumptions about the situations or about the people. Okay. And then we have explanatory, which is what theory testing stuff is about. Okay. So are things like, so why is marriage linked to good health? So we've got people who are married and they are in good health. Why? So what are the mechanisms that can combine the two? Okay, so that's theory testing. Okay, I'm going to quickly go through data and measurement. So some of the things, a lot of the things we're going to talk about in this class are going to be data that is from self-report measurement. Okay, and so a lot of the times we are going to be talking about fixed responses, which is like a yes or no, a liquor scale, like, you know, one through five strongly disagree to strongly agree, that kind of thing, versus open-ended questions like, what do you think about uh, K-pop? And then you start typing your answer, or you start writing your answer. I think K-pop is amazing, you know, that sort of thing. Okay, so what are the advantages of self-report? Well, it's personal to the participant. They get to think about themselves. And here's a here's a secret. People really enjoy talking about themselves. Okay. It's inexpensive, and since people are really, really happy to talk about themselves, it's very easy to obtain, okay? Disadvantages, on the other hand, disadvantages include people misinterpret questions all the time. That Early in my grad school career, I think that's what I had. I had a lot of data of people just misinterpreting the questions that I asked, which is not fun from a researcher standpoint. Recall problems. OK, so you ask somebody to think about the last time they were in, in a party situation and what did they do? Well, if the last time they were in a party situation was a year ago because they are a um, homebody and they uh, introvert and they stay home a lot and they don't go to parties all that often. That was a year ago. I was going to take forever to think about and I'm probably going to get some details wrong, probably going to get most details wrong. Uh, it's open to bias. I mentioned earlier that. People are um, liars. No, I'm just kidding. People are are not very good at being honest about themselves. Okay. Social desirability. People want to be liked by their peers, their superiors. Okay. And then we have the final disadvantage with self-report, which is refusal to disclose. Not great. You, if you're like, nah, I don't want to say that, especially if you're dealing with sensitive topics like racism or uh, sexual assault, people might not want to talk about that and people might not want to give you answers about that. Okay. We also have observational data. Okay. Observational data comes from observers of behavior. It's kind of objective, but it's also kind of Subjective. There are different methods for obtaining observational data. Two of the major sources are behavioral. So somebody sits in, uh, you see this a lot with developmental studies. So you have a, a, a one room where observers sit behind a two way mirror and then you have kids playing in the uh, on the other side in in the other part of the lab. And you can get and, and you can get audio video recordings from that and as well as direct observational. You can also do physiological observational methods where you put like a heart rate monitor on somebody or a pulse ox on their finger or uh, their blood pressure or galvanic skin response for how much they're sweating because they're so nervous. You know, these sorts of things, right? Advantages are more objective. It's more objective to do this kind of thing because you have to develop what are called protocols. It's at least free from the self-report bias of somebody's behaviors. You obviously can't self-report on your heart rate unless you're like, mm, I'm going to take my pulse right now. So it's a, it's a little bit more objective than that. Okay, But there are some subtle biases that still creep in. So observational bias is still researcher bias is still a big thing that we need to get rid of if we're going to make a causal uh, a causal explanation for a cause and an effect in somebody's behavior, okay? But 
it's still better than nothing. Some disadvantages, it's these are proxy measures. So if I'm a behaviorist and I'm watching somebody behave, it's my observation that's being recorded, not the behavior itself. Okay. We don't know what's going on in other people's minds. Reactivity is a huge problem. Expensive equipment, expensive rooms, maybe difficult to code and not easy to capture reality because you have to do things in a in a in a non-organic way. It's not it's not the best. It's not the greatest. Okay. Uh I'm going to talk about two designs that I'm going to be discussing frequently in this class. The first one is a correlational design. So when we get numbers of how much, we want to determine whether or not this how much is related to something else, some other measurement. So we are going to determine a relationship between two things, X and Y. That's what a correlational design tells us. Do they go together or do they go in opposite directions? So we are going to measure or observe the X variable and the Y variable. And then from that, we are going to calculate what is called the Pearson correlation coefficient, which is little r, okay? And it's gonna tell us the direction and the strength of that relationship between X and Y. So let me give you an example. X is gonna be similarity, hence talking about that at the beginning of the, of the video, and Y is going to be attraction, okay? So if we have similarity on the X axis, and attraction on the y-axis, here we see our folks. These are all people that we've measured on their similarity and their attraction, okay? And they seem to be going up. As similarity increases, so does attraction. This would be a positive correlation. R is between zero and one. And in this one, we see that as similarity goes down, or as, excuse me, as similarity goes up, attraction goes down. So they are working in opposite. That's a negative correlation. Those are things that we're gonna, these two things are gonna talk about. Negative correlations are between, R is between zero and negative one, okay? Perfect correlations, are one and negative one, depending on which group you're in here, one or negative one. So here's the positive, here's the negative. So we're going up and we're going down. Whee! Okay, so those are positive and negative correlations. This is, this is much simplified from what I would do in like research methods, for example. So can we get, can we get causation from X and Y just knowing that similarity, as similarity increases, so does attraction? Or when similarity increases, attraction decreases? I don't think so. So Fry, he's like, not sure of correlation or causation. Hmm. Because it could be X causes Y. Oh, it could also be Y causes X. This is called the directionality problem. Similarity could cause liking or attraction, or attraction could increase similarity. Mm. Oh, and then we could have this possibility. Some third variable Z influences X and Y simultaneously. This is called, not surprisingly, the third variable problem or you can just call them confounds. Something else entirely could lead to the changes in similarity and attraction, okay? So remember, correlation does not equal causation. And here is my very favorite comic to describe that in the fewest amount of words I think it's possible. You can pause here to read have a little chuckle to yourself. If you need some help with it, just let me know. The second kind of design that I wanted to talk about is experiments. Experiments now take that 
XY relationship. And here we're going to say, we're gonna rule, try to rule out as many of those Z variables as possible. And we're going to manipulate X, not just measure it, we're gonna manipulate it. We're gonna measure Y. So we're gonna manipulate X. We so, we'll, you'll sometimes hear me call it the independent variable or the predictor variable. And you can have multiple predictors. You can you will also hear me say factors. Factors is another way to refer to the X here. And then we're gonna measure Y. When we change X, we're gonna measure Y. And you'll hear me refer to this as the dependent variable or the outcome variable. Okay. So X to Y, cause to effect similarity to attraction in the example. Okay. There is one direction and it's a band. Sorry. There is one direction. That's the important one to note. So causation requires three things. Relationship between X and Y. Temporal, temporal precedence, that is, the cause always comes before the effect. And freedom from confounds. We're getting rid of all those Z variables. Okay. Now, why do we do experiments? Well, to find out causes. And there are two primary criteria for describing and explaining behavior and, and anything else that we can observe. We have to manipulate the IV, okay? We have to manipulate them. So that involves random assignment. We have to randomly assign somebody to the various aspects of the independent variable. If we don't randomly assign them, then we are not doing an experiment. We are doing some, that's something that's called a quasi-experiment. Almost experiment. That's what quasi stands for. Almost. Okay. And the reason we do random assignment is we want to get those confounds that exist in people, what we'll call individual differences. And the more people that we get that we can randomly assign, the less those things have an impact on our causal relationship. Okay. So random assignment is really, 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 really important. So we have to manipulate the IV and then we have to randomly assign. OK, randomly assign. So if we don't end up manipulating an independent variable, it becomes immediately a quasi experiment. And so these are those experiments that you see where they said, OK, are men different from women? Gender men versus women in this in that dichotomy is a, what's called a subject variable. Subject variables cannot be randomly assigned. They cannot be randomly assigned. And so we need to make sure that if we wanted to do a true experiment, we have to be able to manipulate the variable and then we have to be able to randomly assign that. Okay? Some other considerations, we have to control our environments. So if you're doing stuff in a laboratory, you want to set that laboratory temperature to be a constant, you know, 71, 72, whatever. You know, good, good, comfortable room level. OK, N re reduce noises, uh, uh, make sure different groups don't know too much about other groups. OK, no other systemic confounds like order effects, these sorts of things. Uh, additionally, you want to um, make sure that you're controlling things that aren't going to impact. OK. But you also have to realize that if you do it too much, if you control too much of your environment, you're going to end up um, causing an artificial situation. And that's one of the biggest criticisms to laboratory research is that it's too um, sterile. It's not ecological. It's not the way that we behave in the real world. Okay, And so if you control too much, you might create an unrepresentative situation where you're not going to 
um, perceive or observe the behaviors that you hypothesized. Okay, so it's a balance of of control versus how the situation impacts the person. I will mention very quickly that scientists are biased as well, but science is not biased. So if you come across reports of this is what science says, pause, give it a read, give it a listen, give it a watch, because the science, science has no, no agenda. Some scientists do have an agenda. Sometimes that agenda is just the betterment of, man, uh, of humankind. You know, some scientists do want money, fame, whatever. But the science itself is unbiased. Okay? The scientist is the, the person is the human with fall fall uh, fallacies, foibles, and and fallible fall fallibles, whatever you want to call it. They're the ones who choose the questions. They're the one who operationalize the variables to measure them. They're the ones who choose the samples. They're the ones who choose the measurements, and they're the ones that choose the analyses. Science, however, is not is not biased. The humans are. Okay, so some moderators of the human experience, uh, experience. This is it. This is the last thing that we are going to talk about on this uh, on this particular video. Okay, so moderators of our human experience is biology. The first one that I want to talk about. So generally, this class is a survey class is is what we're going to discuss that most people do most of the time. Because remember, we're talking about group averages. And so we cannot predict an individual's behaviors using the methods that I've mentioned briefly, pre you know, a few minutes ago. And so I do want to make some distinctions from the start, which will come up in examples over the course of the term. OK, so biology, these are your genes. Okay. And it's not just having a gene, but it's the gene regulation and gene expression. And gene expression can be can be altered by the environment. It's called epigenetics. Okay, these are hormones. These are things that are going on in your brain. So all of the neuroscience stuff that I'll mention here and there. So your neurotransmitters, okay, that sort of thing. With respect to biology, I also want to um, add in evolutionary psychology as a methodology. This is the way that we track human universals. Okay, so this is these are ideas that have come about because why are humans the way they are now versus what led to that adaptation in our in our ancestors' lives. And we're talking about like way, 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 way back. Not your grandparents, but like at the dawn of humanity, essentially, and throughout that. Right. So we have acquired these cognitive propensities. So these biases that we'll talk about here and there, like confirmation bias. We also acquired physical features like bipedalism. Why do we walk and our closest uh, um, genetic cousins Chimpanzees, why don't they walk on their two legs? So the, the features of human experience are not just seen cross-culturally, but even in non-human primates. So we can talk about some of these things that even go farther back in our evolutionary tree. Okay, And so evolutionary psychology kind of coalesces with biology and tells us, OK, this is the adaptive problem that this adaptation was intended to solve. Culture, culture is going to um, be a moderator of so many of the things that we're talking about. So culture is the enduring behaviors, ideas, attitudes and traditions shared by a large group of people and then transmitted from one generation to the next, whether this is oral or written or now videoed. 
recorded. It, those things are going from one to the next. That's what we would call culture. We can talk broadly about human culture and the things that humans do from one generation to the next. And then we can talk about cultures within human culture. And then we can talk about subcultures within those cultures. So a lot of the stuff I am going to talk about is Western culture, the culture that I am from and many of my students are from. And then the subcultures in, 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 those, in those cultures. So Western cultures, LBGTQ culture, okay? African-American culture. These are subcultures. They all fit the definition of culture, though. And it runs more deeply than you can ever imagine. It's not just about food or dress preferences. It's more than that. And it's not affected by moving from one culture to the other. Okay? You still retain all of the things that you learned. Okay? And so here is a, <laughs> a simple yet complex flowchart of how gender differences are formed in various behaviors. And so an influencing factor in culture is socialization. And then we also have other biological factors, okay? Then we get a division of labor between the sexes, males and females, uh, among other sexes. We get a division of labor. That division of labor then splits off in the culture to give us gender role expectations, as well as gender-related skills and beliefs, which then, then coalesce in what is perceived as differences in behavior. So you can't just say all oh, men and women are different on this measure. It just doesn't work like that. Okay. Speaking of gender. I want to be very clear that gender and sex are different. And when people think about gender and or sex differences. They typically think of circles. Venn, Venn diagram circles that either overlap or don't overlap. But that is patently wrong because we're talking about men and women, males and females, other genders, other sexes as an overlapping body on some measurement. And so instead of circles, they're actually overlapping curves. And you can see that even if I just use a dichotomy of, of males and females, where the um, median male uh, height is closer to six feet than the median female height, which is closer to five feet, you can see that the vast majority of men and women in this purple section, or males and females, excuse me, males and females, overlap. There's no differences. It's only in the extremes you get differences. Only in the extremes of these two curves do you get differences. So when we say, ah, oh, yeah, there are differences between the sexes or genders in uh, X, Y, and Z, <laughs> we should make policy based on this wrong. Know that you will probably find somebody of a different gender or a different sex than you who is better or worse than you at that particular measurement. Same thing goes for race, okay? Same thing goes for things like handedness, eye color, whatever you wanna think about, whatever division of humans you wanna think about, think about the overlapping curves as opposed to a Venn diagram, okay? Very important. And of course, I mentioned that humans are super complex. So we're not all the same. Actually, every single person that has existed, existing, or will exist is going to be different from you. 100% different. Sure, we may share 99.999999999% of genetic material, 
but that doesn't account for situations. That doesn't account for culture. Doesn't account for all these things. Think about it. Every person who has ever existed previously or now or will in the future will be different from you. That's what individual differences is. That's what we're going to talk about a lot in this class. That's how people are different. Can I get an amen? That is it for this episode of the Social Psych Club. <laughs> Eureka College Psych 203 Social Psych. I hope you're amped for the remaining uh, lectures in this series. Generate some questions. And I'll see you in the live stream. Bye.